welcome all of you to the service this afternoon. And I tell you, last night with Pastor Gabe and this morning with Lauren Larson, how many of y'all enjoyed them? I'm like, they were a they were powerful. And then we got Tommy Bates tonight, Brother Swagger tomorrow night, Tim Hill, Donnie. Folks, all I can say is make sure you've got comfortable shoes. So if you want to run the aisles, you're ready to run the aisles. And so, but we are grateful that all of you have come out. I know many of you come from different parts. I've met up quite a few from California, from New York all the points in between from Florida and then overseas. So let's get started. Father, we are grateful. We're thankful, Father, for what you have instilled within us already. Father, the pre-camp sessions all the way through this morning. Your spirit has been moving. Your spirit has been operating. Your spirit has been flowing. And Father, we just want to plug in with what you are doing. And these entire meetings are about you and what you're doing in the world today and the people that you are raising up today. And so in the next few minutes, I pray that you will give each one of us ears that hear what you are saying, eyes that see what you are doing, hands that are yielded to your service, and a heart yielded to your spirit, and we thank you for it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I'm going to talk with you for just a little while on having a hunger for God. You know, there's a lot of people in the world today that has given up on the church. I hear people complain all the time. I don't know why people are getting discouraged. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what God is doing, not only what he's going to do, but what he's doing right now. You see, too many people are waiting for something. They miss what's happening. If we take the time to let God move in our hearts, then guess what? It's going to be easier to plug in when that spirit starts moving. I used to surf a little bit, and when I would go surfing, you had to catch that wave just right. Now, the irony of that is, I would surf, but I don't know how to swim. I never said I was the sharpest tack in the box, but it never dawned on me that I could fall off the board, which I did once or twice. But I want to you to turn, and I'm not going to be able to read all of the scriptures, so I want to encourage you to write the scriptures down, go back and read them. See, anytime you listen to a speaker, don't take their word for it. Make notes, write the scriptures down, go home and study it and get it from your intellect into your spirit. You'll find out Oftentimes, the person you're listening to, and not, I'm not saying here, you may need to change churches when you get back home. Now, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, it says, and when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Obviously, you want to see a move of God. You want to see the Spirit of God being poured out upon all flesh. And we've seen movements over the years. I go way back. I can remember being involved in the very tail end of the healing revivals, going to the Oral Roberts tent meeting there at the Lakewood Fairgrounds in Atlanta, Georgia in 1966. And that was one of the very last of the big tent crusades here in the United States. Then, of course, you had the charismatic movement. 
and you had the initial outpouring where you had the Spirit of God being poured out on people that had never heard of or believed in the Holy Ghost. Co totally unexpected. My wife and her family are, were all Catholic from New England, from Boston. Now, if you're not familiar, now, Louisiana is very strong traditional with Catholics down here. But being Catholic in Boston is like being Baptist in the South. And that's what I was. But God brought a spirit-filled man in to do Bible studies, and the priest let him come into the Catholic Church. Her family got filled with the Holy Spirit. My wife is the first one in her family to leave the Catholic Church at the age of 14. At the age of 14, she started traveling through Boston and through Brockton, singing on the streets, singing in Bible studies. Then we, we were seeing the Spirit of God being poured out on traditionals who didn't believe. And everybody said, oh, that's it. This is it. This is it. This is what we're looking for. This is what Joel is talking about. Folks, listen to me. You're always going to have people who are going to try to tell you, oh, this is it. This is the final move. Whether it's the final move or whether it's not the final move, we need to act like Jesus is coming tonight and get our act together so he can work through us. So what I'm going to talk for a few minutes on, I want to show you what God has done but where the church is today. Because most people don't realize that the Bible does tell us there's going to be two great movements in the end time. There's two of them. One, we see in Acts chapter 2 when Peter was talking about on the day of Pentecost. And understand, some of the moves we see of God are a foreshadowing of the greater things God wants to do. So we need to enjoy what God is doing now. That doesn't mean it stops with that. That should be the starting place. But a couple of things. The best definition that I have found for revival, and those of you who were in the session yesterday morning heard this, but for the sake of those who were not there and those that are on television, revival refers to a spiritual reawakening from a state of dormancy or stagnation in the life of a believer. It encompasses the resurfacing of a love for God and appreciation of God's holiness, a passion for His Word, His church, a convicting awareness of personal and corporate sin, a spirit of humility and a desire for repentance and growth in righteousness. Now, that's a mouthful, but that pretty well covers all of the bases. And that's what God is trying to tell us. But keep in mind, as we begin going through this, a revival, a move of God can be hijacked. It could be hijacked by hype, pressure, clever marketing, manipulation, politicalization, or personal agenda. Have you ever noticed that when something starts small, people don't really want it? But as something grows, everybody jumps on board and wants a piece of the pie. Why do you think there's so few people who make millions in the stock market because everybody wants to invest what's already been proven. And the ones who have, are making millions upon millions are the ones who usually invest in something before it gets there. You want a stock market tip? Invest in Krispy Kreme donuts. I eat enough alone to keep them in business. But I was just reading this week that McDonald's is going to start selling Krispy Kreme donuts in all of their restaurants. Well, guess what? The minute they made that announcement, their stock went up. The minute they start doing it, it's going up again. That's not 
an investment tip. That comes from John and Josh Rosenstern. <laughs> but what I'm saying, a move of God can be hijacked. And oftentimes, a, pe a person or a movement or a denomination can start with the right motive, but then they have the wrong application. And it's a little like Lauren Larson said this morning, a half-truth is all wrong. You can do the right thing the wrong way and you still mess up. So, we have to be careful that we're not chasing after a movement. We're not chasing after a revival. We're not chasing after a person that we are hard and fast seeking after God. Now, in the United States, there have been two what we would call great awakenings. Some people say three I don't have time to talk about that one today, and I really ha don't have enough time to do these adequate, but I want to show you where the world was when God started pouring His Spirit out so that today, when you see how bad things are, you'll know that God's going to pour His Spirit out upon His sons and His daughters and people who are willing to hear His voice and allow God to work through them and do things that they've never been able to do. When's the last time you laid hands on somebody and saw God heal them in a Walmart parking lot? You may have to do that. When's the last time you had to cast the devil out? When's the last time you shared the gospel with somebody who is lost? That's what God has called us to do. Just a brief, brief background of the first great awakening was from the 1730s to about the 1760s. It was a movement that was rooted in spiritual growth which brought about a national identity. There are many historians who believe that the revival, the first great awakening, and the boldness that people like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield had to stand up and proclaim truth and righteousness in the midst when this nation was losing our spiritual identity. They stood up. And it was George, uh, or it was uh, Jonathan Edwards who preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which ironically, he preached it in the 1700s, and seminaries still use that today to teach homiletics. I would change it a little bit. I wouldn't say it's sinners in the hands of an angry God. I would say it's sinners in the hands of a loving God who is reaching out to the lost and calling them in today. But why was the first great awakening important to us? First, the influence it had on our early church fathers. Now, you go back and look at the early church fathers and all of their writings. They always proclaimed God. They always incited the Bible. They always called for people to come back to God. It was Benjamin Franklin who said when they were in Philadelphia writing the Constitution that they opened every day in prayer. And some of you may have heard me say it on one of the programs. That statement that the liberals like to use separation of church and state that is nowhere to be found in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or any of the amendments. The separation of church and state was written by Thomas Jefferson to a group of Baptist ministers in Danville, Connecticut, assuring them that the government would never impose a single religion on the people of the United States, that they would be free to worship the way they chose. And yet, you see how people have taken and twisted. 
So, folks, it's time for the church to stand back up. We cannot sit back and be these limp-livered, weak-kneed cowards who let the world run over us. If you're going to do that, you're in the wrong place. We got to stand up for righteousness. The first great awakening came when men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield stood up for righteousness when the rest of the world, depravity, drinking, promiscuity, prostitution, you name it. And see, they started getting away when the pilgrims first landed in 1620, they came here looking for religious freedom. But you know what happens? Is the closer we get, we enjoy it, then we get comfortable. Once we get comfortable, the pressure starts getting applied. Then we start suffering. And once we start suffering, then we cry out to God in repentance. He pours his spirit out, and everything goes well for a little while. Then we start getting complacent again. Complacency is one of the biggest enemies of the church. We get too comfortable. We get too satisfied. And guess what? Why would you ever want to retire from ministry. I look over sitting there. You've got Brother Swagger, 89 years old. And do you know he is here seven days a week? <laughs> At 89. Probably sold more albums and more music than any other Christian artist. He could enjoy, like a lot of them do, look at what I have accomplished for God. No, because people do not quit going to hell. People do not quit getting sick. Demons do not quit harassing people. So why should we quit? It is our responsibility to labor in the fields for God until Jesus comes. My retirement plan is even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. There is nothing I enjoy doing more than I do what I'm doing now. There's nothing I enjoy doing more than what I am doing now. Now, the two things, I shared the first one, the impact it had on our founding fathers. The second one is the first great awakening opened our eyes to the enlightenment or the age of reason. And understand that at that time, the Industrial Revolution was just beginning to take off in Europe. And what would happen in Europe would make its way over here. And so, the people here, instead of going to their churches, attendance was dwindling. Denominations were having a hard time finding people to filled their pulpits, and there's some churches today that cannot find enough ministers to fill pulpits. Churches are closing all the time because they cannot find ministers. So if you want to minister, go somewhere where nobody wants to go. The first church that my wife and I pastored, and she's sitting over there, the first church we pastored had 30 people in it if you counted the pregnant women twice. <laughs> and that's not an exaggeration. We were there for five years through a whole series of things. When we left, we were almost 300. The, the whole town was only 3,500 people. So we had almost 10% of the city's population coming to church. Why? Was I good? Nope. Trust me. Hang around me long enough and you'll find that out for yourself. The only thing I do know how to do is love people. I do, I do love people. I draw strength from loving people and caring for them. But you know what? They went out and reached their friends, their neighbors, people they worked with. And revival started coming. 
So, a return to spirituality combated the age of reason that was coming in. And that's what you and I have got to get ready for. People are smarter today. They have more degrees than at any time in history. People are more, I don't want to say intellectual, because just because you have a degree, that doesn't mean you're smart. You could have a degree, and that just meant you paid the price and stayed there long enough to get through the requirements. I've met some very ignorant PhDs. That's why if you're looking to educate somebody, you need to send them to JSBC. You need to send them here to Bible school for at least two years. At least two years. Get them so rooted and grounded and established in God that when they go to a secular university, those atheistic professors are not going to shake their faith. And if you want to find out more about the Bible college, you can see Dr. Watts. He's out in the lobby before and after every service, and he'll help you in any way that he can. We, we cannot let the world's way of doing things influence us. And we can't compromise to the world's way. Now, the second great awakening occurred in the 1790s. That's when it began. The Revolutionary War had been fought. We're about 25 years afterwards. People, are, again, were comfortable. We're not in a period of suffering. We're not in a period where we're about to be imprisoned or killed for our faith. So, <clears throat> everybody was getting comfortable again. And one of the movements, <clears throat> what was happening? We were slipping back into their old way of life. Now, if you, if you really want to find out what this is like, let me encourage you, go back and study the book of Judges. If you look at the book of Judges, some of you say, Judges? Yes, right after Joshua. Seven times in that book, you see Israel serving God. Then all of a sudden, they got comfortable, quit serving God, allowed false idols in. Foreign kingdoms came in, conquered them, defeated them. They were suffering. They repented, cried out to God. God would raise somebody up. And when God would raise somebody up, guess what? Then there was always a battle to be fought. Listen, if you think you could sit at your couch at home with your feet propped up, having some good old southern sweet tea, and get what God has for you, you're fooling yourself. And trust me, I like sweet tea. But you've got to do something. <coughs> it's, it's like Lauren said this morning. First of all, you've got to realize that our faith has got to be founded forever in Christ. Listen, I've known people over the years who had faith in their faith. Oh, yeah, they had faith in their faith. Guess what? That's going to get you. Nothing. I, had, I know people who said, well, if I say it enough, it'll happen. No, that'll get you out of breath and hoarse. <laughs> if our faith is not forever founded in the Word of God and in Christ and the cross, because that's where our help comes from. So if you need some, all you got to do is go back to the cross. Now, in the second Great Awakening, you had folks like Charles Finney and D.L. Moody and folks like this. Now, in the second Great Awakening, there were two things that happened that were good for us, but they got corrupted. Number one was they started education. 
You've heard of a few of the schools, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Dartmouth, Brown. Those came out of the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening. And yet look how the enemy has corrupted and he has stolen what God intended to train men and women. That's why we've got to stand up for godly institutions like JSBC. And we've got to stand. And Brother Swagger, you could rest assured, I believe that as long as Gabriel is alive, that college is going to be putting out men and women of God that are going to go around the world and preach the uncompromised message of the cross, and we will see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people saved. Because that's what God has called us to do. Now, God hijacked the institutions. But the second great thing that came out of the second great awakening is a little thing that you're sitting in today called camp meetings. They actually started out of the second great awakening. Now, they were called camp meetings for a reason. Now, I know some of you have your travel trailers and your RVs that you drove down. Some are parked at back. But back in those days, they did not have a renaissance next door to the church. They didn't even have a Motel 6. Tom Bodette hadn't been born yet. So people would travel by wagon or horse, get to a location, usually it was a church, and they had to camp out. They'd pitch their tents. Some of them would just sleep in sleepy bags out under the stars. So that literally is where the term camp meeting originated because the people had to camp in order to have a place to stay. Now, you have air conditioning, you have lights, you have sound, you have guys telling you when to start, and in a few minutes, he'll come out and tell me when to be quiet. A lot like my wife. And the way they started, and, I, and I'll talk about some of the great early camp meetings that really became the firebrand for everything else. Now, if you want to know why Tommy Bates, and I was talking to him a few minutes ago, and I said, your name will come up in this message because all the early great camp meetings happened in the area where he lives, in eastern Kentucky. And, but they would go, most of them were either Methodist or Presbyterians. And they had what they called communion services. Now, communion services wasn't coming to church on a Sunday morning, letting them hand you a little cup and a piece of bread, or having a chalice that everybody drank out of the same thing, which I never have liked, because I don't have a clue who's been drinking and taking communion before me. But their communion were usually three to five day meetings. And people would drive in from all the areas, usually anywhere from local to a 50, maybe 100-mile radius, depending. And they would come to this church house. And this was not just eastern Kentucky. It happened all over the country. And they would have services, three to five days. And the last service would always be on a Sunday. And at the last service everyone there would always share in the Lord's Supper. That's why they were called communion meetings, because everyone knew that at the end of the meeting, there was going to be communion. Well, what happened is, think about this. These broke out. Camp meetings, as we know them, 
And we'll talk about Cane Ridge in a moment. That was in 1801. But five years before, nobody would have ever thought of a camp meeting. Nobody would have ever thought particularly in Kentucky, because Kentucky was one of the worst areas there was in the state. Kentucky was a wild frontier at the time. It's where everybody went. When you hear the stories of the old Wild West, at one point, the old Wild West was Kentucky. So there was a lot of bootlegging. There was a lot of alcohol. There was a lot of saloons. There was a lot of crime. That's where prisoners were sent. That's where people that were considered undesirable were all sent to Kentucky because nobody really cared what happened to them at that time. But and at one time on a trip to Tennessee in 1794, it was Francis Asbury wrote about Kentucky. Now, this is the same Francis Asbury who's has the university in Kentucky named after him where God was spontaneously pouring his spirit out a few months ago. He said this, when I reflect that not one in a hundred came here to get religion, but rather to get plenty of good land, I think that it will be well if some or many do not eventually lose their soul. That's how concerned Asbury was. Now, the Transylvania, and Transylvania is not where Count Dracula lived. Transylvania is an area around Louisville, Kentucky. The Transylvania Presbytery, which was a magazine at the time, came out, and this is what they said. They were deep concerns about the prevalence of vice and infidelity, the great apparent declension of true vital religion in too many places. Now, does that sound like the day that you and I are living in? I mean, could you remember the times when you could turn television on and you were not afraid for your children to watch TV without you being in the room? Now you can't turn a television on. The commercials are vulgar. It's almost like every program feels like they either have to have a lot of sex, LGBTQ+, and everything else to draw people in. Have you seen churches begin to compromise? Now, with the first and second great awakening, I understand we're talking about Methodists and Presbyterians. The Methodist church split within the last couple of years over the LGBTQ+. In Cleveland, Tennessee, where I lived for quite a while, I had friends who went to the different Methodist churches. There was an all-out war. Are we staying united or are we going global? And it didn't really make sense to me because the United Methodist Church are the ones who are embracing a liberal agenda, and the global church, which you would think, okay, they're global, so they're inclusive. No, they're the ones that are the conservatives. So, and they literally split, and people who have been best of friends no longer talk because one went liberal and one stayed conservative. Yet these were churches that started out of the great awakening and the movements that were there. And then false religions were growing up. Now, when we say false religions, back then it was universalism and deism. Now, universalism basically just simply says that all will be saved. doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you do, your lifestyle. Everybody's ultimately in God's universe is going to be saved. And then you had the deist, 
And basically, the deist said that God is uninvolved in the world. He don't really care about him. He made it. He created it. You messed it up. You own your own. And then you had these two get together. And this was in the late 1700s. And church attendance was going down. Hmm. Church attendance is going down today, isn't it? Churches are closing. Denominations are struggling. A lot of what they were experiencing in the late 1700s are the same thing you and I are experiencing and seeing today. But guess what? On that scene, God raised up men and women that didn't care what the world was doing. They stood up boldly and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ and called people to repentance. There's too many so-called Christians today that are worried about what their neighbor's going to think, what their boss is going to think. I used to take my Bible to school with me. I started Bible studies in high school. People would make fun of me. So one day people asked me, hey, you heard the latest song by the who? I said, who? Yeah, you heard their latest song. I said, who's? They said, the who? That's what I asked you, who? I honestly had no clue that there was a group called the who. They said, well, what do you listen to? I said, gospel, you know, the Happy Goodmans, the Florida Boys, the Dixie Echoes, and they just laughed at me and walked off. Brothers, I get this before I met you. I was probably 12, 13 at the time. The next day in class, between class, I'm walking down the hall, and all of a sudden these guys lined up, and they started singing. Jubilee, Jubilee, you're invited to a gospel jubilee. They knew the theme song to my favorite TV program. So instead of getting embarrassed, I just stopped, started directing them. <laughs> Why not? A couple of them wound up getting saved. I'd have, I had a guy one day, we were on the job. He called me over to his truck. We were doing landscaping, and he had a Playboy. And he opens a Playboy up to the centerfold. He says, hey, preacher, what you think it is? I look, I go, nice smile, turned around and walked off. <laughs> you know, the next week, that same boy, we were in a ditch digging. That boy looked at me. And he had his shovel, and he said, I want to get saved. Will you pray for me? So how you act will impact those around you. Amen. So if you're going to get your feelings hurt, serving Christ today is not for the weak of heart. But when I went back and looked at the circumstances behind the Great Awakening, it so mirrors what's going on in the world today. There wasn't a whole lot, and all this was going on just before the camp meetings broke out. Now, camp meetings, and I think, I think there are two. Some people think that camp meetings actually started with a Presbyterian member named James McCready. James McCready was a preacher from North Carolina who moved to Kentucky, to the wilderness. And records of his life said that he was a fiery, bold preacher who was an imposingly large man, tall, big man, and when he preached, everybody could hear it, and they didn't need the microphone, or they didn't need the system. And one of the guys who actually went to hear him preach was a guy named Barton Stone, who pastored 
a church called the Cane Ridge Presbyterian Church. This, this is what Barton said. He said, my mind was chained by him and followed him closely in his realms of heaven, earth, and hell with feelings indescribable. This was a pastor a few miles away that came to see what God was doing. But you know what he did? He didn't just hear it. He then turned around and took it back. And that became known as the Cane Ridge Revival in Kentucky. Now, normally they may have from a few dozen to a couple of hundred. Cane Ridge, it is said, may have had up to 20,000 people at that meeting. Why? Because somebody stood up and preached righteousness without fear of what everybody was going to say or do. Folks, would that we would have that kind of boldness. If we could just quit worrying what people are going to say about us, do to us, and be more concerned with, Father, thy will be done. You're not going to be asked to go to a cross. If you did, it wouldn't do anything but make you a martyr. Christ paid that price. But in the garden, he prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Are we willing to risk losing a friend or a job or something like that for the sake of Christ? You should be the best employee at that place. They should never want to get rid of you because they can't find anybody to work as good as you. Guess what? You can pray with somebody before work. You can pray with them after work. Or you can take them to a mill and share the gospel with them. You don't have to take somebody's time off the clock to do it. Meet them after work. Oh, well, after work, put it on hold. My wife has eaten more than one meal that has gotten cold because I didn't show up on time because I got caught up in something. She has put up with me next month. My wife will have put up with me for 35 years. I promise you, I am not going to call her the old gray mare. <laughs> As some have. But there's going to have to be a special place in heaven for the wives who have put up with minister husbands and for husbands who put up with minister wives because the sacrifices they make, few people understand. Amen. Now, with Cain Ridge, the revival started by McCrary lasted for two years. Cain Ridge only lasted for a couple of weeks. But when Cain Ridge hit, it was the one that exploded and it was out of Cain Ridge that people started taking that camp meeting farther west and farther west and farther west. So you see, you'll never know how the impact of your actions have on somebody else. That's why you better be obedient and you better be faithful to God. Because when James McCready went, it said that the glory of scriptural religion has arrived in western Kentucky. Think about that. The glory of scriptural religion. Now, I'm not going to talk about the, the third great awakening, which started just before the Civil War into the 1920s, but that's when you had ministers that, that God raised up Dwight Moody, Billy Sunday, Bob Jones. Ever heard of Moody Bible Institute? Bob Jones University? Those ministers came up through the Great Awakening, and they restored the importance of having sound
theology in our lives. Now, in what little time I have left, I'm going to do my best to show you what the Scriptures say about the two revivals of the end time. So, for the first one, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians, I mean, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. I'm not going to take the time to read it, but I do want you to go back and read it. There are certain characteristics found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, that you will see in the world today. See if any of these will ring true to you. It says, perilous times. That's definitely happening. Men love their own selves, covetous, they're greedy, boasters, proud, they're bragging, they're arrogant, they're conceited, they're blasphemers. Some of the things you see on television today, some of the songs and some of the things that pass today for music are absolutely blasphemous. They're disobedient to parents. I'm sorry. If your little boy or girl goes to elementary school and comes home a cat, they're disobedient to parents. They're unthankful, unholy, which means that they, have, they do not have compassion or pity on others. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, which means they're wild and savage. I just read last week where there were three boys who robbed a bank, and I think the oldest one was like 15. And the, and the other two were like one was 12 or something, but the oldest one was 15. Fierce. Despisers of those who are good. Don't worry, if they're talking about you, they don't have time to talk about something else. And if they're talking about you, at least they've got good material to work with. God does not base his opinion on you on what somebody else says. It's how do you stand in the cross? Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Churches going through the motions that think that they're good because they go to church. Leading captive, silly women, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. People are smarter today than they've ever been but they know less and we're less connected than we have ever been. Do any of those traits sound like what you and I are facing in the world today? They are, right? That's why the same thing is what they faced with the first and the second great awakening. So I'm not discouraging, I am encouraging you. So when people start doing this, you oh, bless God, you're about to do something, and Father, I want to be part of it. Now, let's get to the second. And of course, the second one is found in Acts chapter 2, and you can begin with verse 15, but go with verse 15 all the way through verse 42. And again, I do not have time to read it all. I'm just trying to give you an overview and an introduction so that hopefully you will go back because we can hear some of the greatest messages, but if it doesn't encourage us and challenge us to do something for God, we'll just take it back home with us and put it on the shelf with all the other great conferences. We want to be stirred up to make a difference for Jesus. What would have happened had Lester Summerall's mother and sister not gone to Faraday, Louisiana and been willing to... Be, I've gone through Faraday a couple of times. I don't know why Brother Swaggart said it was so small. When I went through there, they had a Kentucky Fried Chicken, they had a Sonic, and they had a donut shop. What else do you need? It is a very small town. 
But look at, out of that little teeny small town, the world has been reached with the gospel. Now, I'm going to go through very quick what Acts says. When most people read Acts related to the end time, all they want to do is read this portion where Peter is quoting out of Joel. And it will come to pass in the last days. I will pour my spirit. Okay, that's part of it. But read it, that whole thing, that is not all there is. He says, if you go back and start with verse 15, he'll pour his spirit out upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision. He'll pour his spirit out upon his handmaidens and his servants. They will prophesy. There'll be signs in heaven, signs in the earth, blood, fire, vapor of smoke, sun turned to darkness, moon turned to blood, the great and notable day of the Lord when Jesus returns. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. God will have a remnant. The question is, are you willing to be part of that? Because if you are, guess what? That fire is going to go back. And you know, Cane Ridge didn't stay in Kentucky. Cane Ridge went everywhere, just like the revival at the Red River in Kentucky. It didn't stay in Red River because Barton went to hear McCready, and he took it back to Cane Ridge. Ridge and people in Cane Ridge became evangelists all over the frontier. So you never know. See, we don't know looking out what y'all may wind up doing for God. Don't put yourself down. Don't be critical of yourself. Don't say, I don't do this, I don't do this. You may not, but God can. All he takes is you to say, okay, Lord, here am I. That's all that you need. Now, I'm going to share with you just very quickly the events. And again, you see this in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to share with you, and then we're going to pray, events that will precede a move of God. And you can find every one of these in Acts chapter 2. Number one, they have a love for the Word of God. They have a love for the Word of God. Number two, they had a true repentance. A lot of people will repent, but they repent because they got caught. True repentance leads to a lifestyle change. Third, they did water baptism because water baptism for them was an outward sign publicly of what God had done inside. Water baptism does not save you. The only way to get saved is what he told us in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be safe. And with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans, I said eight, it's actually ten. That's what we've got to do. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through the finished work of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. Romans 4, 25 He was delivered from my offenses, raised again for my justification. We have to stay in the right doctrine. Folks, don't be sold a bill of good by somebody who looks good, sounds good, feels good. You better make sure that it lines up with the Word of God rightly divided. Fellowship. After COVID, there are 
thousands of Christians who'll just stay home. That TV becomes their church. I used to tell people, but they said, well, this guy on television, that's my pastor. I said, okay, we'll call him up when you need a hospital visit. Fellowship, care for others. When we truly lose sight of us and start thinking about who Jesus is, then he can start working through you because it's not about me. It's about him and bringing people to Christ. And finally, prayer. Prayer. Those are very simple steps. And again, it's been a very simple message. I've tried to get through a lot in a very short time. But my whole intent is to encourage you to start doing something for God. And when you watch the news or you read the paper or you surf the internet and you see how everything is going bad, everything is going wrong, everything is tough, remember that God is still in control for those who will let him. Doesn't mean you won't have a hard time. It does not mean that you're not going to go through things because Jesus himself told us in John chapter 16, these things have I said unto you that in this world you may have peace, but know that in this world you shall have tribulation. Look at 1633. So don't think it's strange when things happen. When they happen, they're going to serve to show you where your faith really is. Is your faith in that possession? Is your faith in that doctor? Or is your faith grounded in the cross where it should be? Stand up with me. I appreciate all of y'all coming out this afternoon. Don't forget tonight, Tommy Bates is going to be here. And all I could say is you better have your track shoes on. <laughs> and you better get here early. And then tomorrow morning, I believe is Donnie, I believe is in the morning, and then tomorrow afternoon, uh, Sean or Lauren, no, 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 Joseph, I think it's tomorrow afternoon, and then tomorrow night, the man himself, Brother Swaggart. So, Father, we are grateful today for who you are. We're grateful today, Father God, for what you're doing. And Father, as we took a brief look through history, it should always remind us of who you are. And as bad as things may seem, Father, you're greater. You are greater. And we thank you for what you've already done and what you're going to do in our lives. And as we get ready to go out, I pray that you will give everybody rest. Those that are going to the studios, let them see what an endeavor it is to put this on. And we thank you today in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Tonight. We hope you enjoyed this camp meeting service from the Sun Life Broadcasting Network. 